having an informative session on personal taxation, next we will have a session on capital gains presented by Subira Agarwal, partner, Grand Horton Bharat. Subira has 17 plus years of experience in mergers, acquisition, trust structuring, corporate restructuring, capital restructuring, due diligence, and cross-border transactions inbound and outbound. She specializes in corporate restructurings and promote rationalization from a tax and regulatory perspective. She is active in panel discussions and tax seminars conducted by varied professional institutions, etc. Greetings, Subira. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Riddhima. It's a pleasure meeting you on online. Great, great. So the session is all yours now. I don't have the right to share the screen, Riddhima. Just one second. I think you can share it now. Yes, I can. Just give okay. me a minute. Uh, my screen is visible yes yes uh please go to the slide share, show more and then yeah I, i'll do that uh shall i begin correct yeah please yeah. uh hello everybody it's a pleasure meeting everybody online uh, and I hope and I have been attending the past two sessions. They have been very knowledgeable. Uh, I mean, I hope I'm able to do justice to the topic which has been given to me. Uh, so we actually had been expecting a philanthropy of changes in the capital game regime, because as we are all aware, there are, you know, uh, there are multiple capital gains tax rates applicable. There are different classes of assets. There's different classes of period of holding provided because of which we had always, I mean, there was a lot of news also on this, that probably in this budget, uh, they will simplify the capital gain tax regime. So overall that has not happened. However, there are some critical changes which have come in the capital gain tax implications, which I am trying to cover in this session. One most critical one of my, one which is being talked about most is the taxability of uh, market linked debentures. So what are market linked debentures? So market linked debentures, if I talked about, you know, there are two aspects to market linked debentures. The principal part of the market linked debenture is like a debt. Whereas the return is linked to either the market indices or some particular security or to gold, any listed security. So what happens is that in a market linked debentures, you have, you have uh, debentures or you have MLDs where the principal is secured and there are ones in which the principal is also not secured. So if the principal is secured and the return is linked to say the uh, Nifty index, then and say the life of the MLT is 10 months, then you get a 10% return on it. So what happens is if you've bought a market link debenture of say 10 lakhs, after 10 months, you get back the 10 lakhs plus the 10% interest on a cumulative basis. You don't get it on a month to month basis, but you get the return when the redemption comes true. So what used to happen is that since my principal is secure and generally what the expectation was, or they were structured in a manner that the interest is also secured. If in the interim period, the MLD was being sold, how the holder of the MLD was treating the return. So he will get say after five months, he's selling the MLD a 1 lakh principal uh, sorry a 10 lakh pr principal amount plus a 50000 he's able to sell for 10 lakh 50000 50000 actually is an interest accumulation but it was treated as long term capital gain and since these were listed there was a tax implication on 10% this budget is now what it is saying that this security is like is in the nature of a derivative 
and therefore irrespective of your period of holding the entire return should be taxed at the rate of the short term capital gain in fact they have given a very specific definition of market link debentures now which says it's a security having underlying principal component in the form of a debt security and the return is linked to a market returns or underlying securities or indices or any other kind of assets so this is more like i would say that probably the understanding was always this but it was being interpreted in a different manner the interest was being treated as a capital gain and people were paying uh, tax as a capital gain sorry as uh, as capital gain now they have clarified that irrespective of your period of holding you you will be subject to short term capital gain on that instrument so this is specifically going to uh, affect the hnis who used to make a lot of investments through mlds and this will lead to them basically rehashing their um, investment plans the next uh, amendment which i would like to uh, bring to notice is the one relating to edrs so sebi is the regulatory body as as far as the gold exchange is concerned and they have set up a framework for uh, spot trading the bsc came out with the egrs in october 2022 now so the framework is set but if there are not requisite changes or requisite uh, uh, provisions for making the conversion of hard gold into egr a tax exempt transaction nobody would go for it and the entire objective around egrs was that the gold the, that the people should stop stop kind of hoarding gold and it should come into the market economy and so the government has now brought about certain changes as far as egrs is concerned and what they are basically saying is if you convert gold into an egr then you will have no tax implications on the conversion and the period of holding of the egr would run from the period when you had bought the gold and similarly the cost of acquisition of the egr would be the same as that of the gold and vice versa or it is true so this is a good change in a way that you know in india there is a lot of uh, mentality or uh, or you know people kind of buy gold a lot so this could be an alternate form of investment rather than investing in hard gold it is better to invest in egrs which then kind of adds to the economic progress of the country as well this is again another change which is uh, affecting the hnis uh, predominantly so under 54 and 54 f earlier there was no threshold on the quantum of uh, monetary threshold on the quantum of exemption which, which you were getting now they have said that the maximum capital gain benefit that you can get is 10 crores see my personal view on this is in india you know in india is a very big country and in each state you know the property dynamics are very different and therefore maybe this threshold of 10 crores could have been linked to factors such as whether the investor is from an ncr region or a non ncr region or whether he is from an a metro or a non metro because the cost of properties is very different now in today's time if a uh, if an entrepreneur is making a significant divestment if suppose he is selling off his business and the, he wants to do some tax planning around his earnings from the divestment a 10 crore threshold would not be very attractive for him and just to bring parity i really feel that they should have linked it to the place where the investment is being made and what are the usual property rates in those uh, areas basically the next change is more like a clarificatory change where it really says that in case of intangible assets which are self generated the cost of acquisition as well as the cost of improvement will be taken as nil so when we are calculating capital gain on any asset the factors that we need for calculation of capital gain are like date of acquisition cost of acquisition consideration date of transfer 
and in the supreme court in the case of bc shrinivasan had held that if the cost of acquisition is not known then the computation mechanism fails this change will put to rest that argument and now even if the now in a way the cost of acquisition has been provided by the law that it is nil so we can't take the position that the computation mechanism is failing in case of self generated intangible assets as far as borrowed capital is concerned what was presently some individuals how they were doing is that if there is an interest on borrowed capital they were claiming it as a deduction under section 24 also when they were computing their income from house property and then that interest was also being added to the cost of acquisition and cost of uh, improvement at the time of sale of property so in a way there was a double benefit in that through this change where now the, the government is saying that if you've claimed an interest as a deduction under 24 you cannot claim it while computing capital gain so this is this is kind of a rectification which they have brought about that it disables a person to claim an exemption under two provisions of law and i think so that's always the intent of law that for the same expense you can't uh, get a double benefit the next one again is uh, a, a significant change where it says that if there is a capital gain so what was happening till now is that when a person was calculating capital gain on a land or building which has been transferred under a under a jda the sale consideration was equal to the stamp duty value of the property plus the cash consideration so the position which people used to take was that if they are getting uh, consideration over and above the stamp duty value in the form of say a bank transfer so that they were not considering while calculating the uh, capital gain now the government is saying that the total amount received whether it is in form of check cash or any other mode that has to be taken into consideration while calculating capital gain so the next change is with regards to transfer of assets Uh, from an overseas fund to a fund in india this change is very simple where only the sunset date has been shifted from march 23 to march 25 the next change is not really a change under the capital gain regime but a new section 115 bae has been introduced for corporate uh, uh, cooperative societies which undertake manufacturing activities various tax rates 15% 22% has been uh, has been specified that if the cooperative society is engaged in manufacturing activity they will be subject to 15% or else they will be subject to 22% further it is mentioned that if the cooperative society is making making short term capital gain out of non depreciable assets then they will be subject to 22% capital gains tax this is all for my side as far as capital gain uh, provisions are concerned however you know i would uh, really like to put my view on a few things like we were talking about the capital gains tax regime which we were expecting that there will be some simplification and which has not happened uh, this is something i think so should have happened because it becomes it 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 is it is kind of a very difficult scenario for the sse and especially for the layman they they kind of become dependent on the professionals only to do their own tax calculations then the tds structure the tcs and the tds regime which we have we have 194q on one hand and 206c on the other hand so again there were we were expecting some kind of a rationalization similarly on redemption of preference shares technically speaking redemption of preference shares is a capital gain event but there has been questions around whether 115qa also becomes applicable on redemption of preference shares uh, because there is no clarity around that then there is there the rbi and the mca has allowed cross border transactions both inbound and outbound but the tax still does not talks about the tax implications on an outbound merger or demerger so there is a lot to be done uh, a significant budget this time very pragmatic budget and they have brought about significant changes also but i think so there is much more to be done as far as the capital gain regime is concerned Rizam that's all from my side if there are any questions i'll be happy to take that
Yes, we do have some questions coming. Thank you, Sugira. Investment made in residential property above 10 crores on sale of shares, house, etc. How will it be taxed? LTCG or STCG? Investment made in residential property. Correct. Right. So, uh, see, 54 or 54F was providing that you can invest in residential property if you've made a capital gain on some other form of asset. So, uh, we will have to see that uh, from where the capital gain is being earned. So okay. it is. it does not depend upon where you are investing. It, we have to see the source of capital gain. So if it is shares, it's, suppose if it is unlisted shares and you've been holding them for more than 24 months, then it becomes long-term capital gain. Right. Or else if it is listed, it becomes 10, uh, it becomes 10 percent, depending on your period of holding and the class of assets. 54F, 54F, uh, 54F and 54 are just enablers to, uh, to enable you to do some tax planning. And they, that has been restricted now. Okay, okay, got it. So whether 10 crore capital gain limit is for one property in lifetime of SSC or all cumulative capital gain of all properties sold during the span of SSC? Yeah, I, I think so. It's a uh, it's a one time benefit which the government has given, and in fact, you know, it depends upon the number of properties which you are presently holding. According to fifty four F, you can at max hold two properties. So if you have already bought two properties, you cannot go and invest in a third property to take the benefit of fifty four F. Correct. Next query, which we have once again. What would be the valuation of brand in case of sale of brand from point of view of income tax? <laughs> it's, that's, a, that's a very subjective question. Generally, you know, the value of brand is linked to the value of business. So brand itself uh, is not, I mean, there is no parameter provided in the Income Tax Act as to how a brand will be valued. And in fact, it has been a subject of litigation also, because what happens is, especially in cross-border transactions, if you transfer brand from India to overseas, even transfer pricing becomes applicable. So right. generally, general principle is that the value of brand should be equivalent to the value of business it represents. Correct. But it is a tricky one because, you know, you do DCF valuations five years later, your DCF valuations may not hold good. So, so, so it's a tricky thing, basically. So, uh, Suvida, what do you think is the reason behind introducing this 10 crore limit under Section 54 and 54F? See, they are saying that the logic given in the memorandum is that it was to promote the housing sector. And since that is no longer a requirement, they have they are withdrawing this uh, uh, this exemption. But I think so. What they are really doing is that all the exemption provisions they are trying to simplify the tax regime, and that is why the threshold the thrust thrust is now more on the new tax regime than the old tax regime where you were able to claim all these tax exemptions. So it, the, the, the thrust is on simplification and therefore slowly and slowly they are reducing the exemptions basically. Right. Moving on to our next query. Uh, so uh, when land is acquired by government and they issue TDR, is it a case that cost of TDR is nil? Mm, this I'll have to check. This I'll have okay. to check. Okay. And uh, next, another query which is so there is no concept of LTCG in MLD irrespective of period of holding. Yes, nothing. They have done all, done away with the, altogether. They okay. have not even mentioned a period of holding. They are saying any gain, short term capital gain. Interesting. Any uh, thoughts on impact of sale of self generated assets, patent, patents, etc., and capital gain arising on the same? So now, since they have clarified that self-generated assets, intangible assets, the value is nil. And principally, that is the position we used to take, unless and until you become very aggressive and you say that since there is no cost, uh, therefore, there will be no tax implication because the computation mechanism was failing. But conservatively, the position was always this, that if it is a self-generated asset, 
then the right. cost is nil. So I think so. This is the correct position which is now being clarified. Correct, right? Due for a long time, right? Due for a long time. Yes, this has been a subject because the moment you take an aggressive position, uh, you are bound to get into a litigation scenario. Right, and it have been a like there were bundle of litigations pending out of it, right? Yes, definitely. So another intangible asset question coming is. How would you compute valuation of intangible assets in case of slum sale? So again, I mean, depends upon what the intangible asset is. You know, if it is uh, if it is an IPR on which you have spent uh, uh, funds on, suppose there is some research which you have done, so there could be cost associated with it. If it is right. simple brand, there could have been marketing expenses. So depends upon what has been capitalized. But again, that all will go in your books. Whether you will be able to claim it in tax is a question mark now. Okay, okay. Right. This is also like it. It's it will take time to analyze. I think when the provisions are more clear yes. and practiced. Right. Right. Uh, I think another very hot question of ten crore is: Can exemption of rupees ten crore? each be claimed in both provisions of section 54 and 54f or they should be clubbed no no they should be clubbed you cannot uh, claim the same benefit twice again or split it even it doesn't provides that way okay okay we we do have time sure we can go for another query right yeah yeah so with the new tax on mlds be applicable for MLD sold before 1st April 2024 or April 23? I think so. It is effective from the next uh, assessment year. So it should be applicable from 1st April 23. I'll have to check that. But I think so. That's that's the intent. Okay. Uh, so, Savina, while we wait for more queries on uh, to come, can I ask you a question that what were actually your expectations for the capital gains because so, India is a growing economy now, and especially virtual digital asset, I think was one such thing that more clarification required. Right? So, so that's that's true. And you know, in the capital gain regime, if you see today, it's become pretty complicated now. So, if you see, if if it is a non-resident who's selling even unlisted shares, they are subject to ten percent tax, whereas a resident is subject to twenty percent tax. Correct. So this itself is an anomaly that you giving a benefit to a non-resident. It is basically, okay, the objective is to attract investment from overseas, but from a domestic player perspective, and people used to, you know, plan around it. They would want to shift residency for a particular year. So you are kind of, you know, encouraging people to uh, take steps to step to do a tax planning, which is not the intent of the law. Okay. So, so, so that was one angle, I think. So the tax rate harmonization is something which was really uh, expected. I mean, right. if you see in the this budget, the main critical, not, not capital gain, but the 56-7B implication, which they have extended it to uh, fundraise from overseas as well. If you see, they have said that it, any investment coming from overseas cannot be above the 5627B value, which is basically the DCF value. Whereas FEMA talks about that the lower threshold, threshold is 5627B, which is DCF value. So if okay. a company is raising funds from overseas at a value above its DCF value, it would mean that it will become taxable under 56. So right. on what I mean, this becomes a discouragement for the companies to raise funds from overseas at higher values. Absolutely. So that has created a kind of anomaly. We we expect that before the bill gets approved in the parliament, maybe there will be some clarification on that. Yeah, that is, I think, is very much required. Yeah. Any other expectations which you were thinking was very relevant? So like if you see the social stock exchange has been now uh, uh, being considered in fact in an in principle approval has been given to the NSC and the BSC. So we were expecting some changes, some uh, clarifications with regard to ATG will come. 
in that, that any investments which you made through a social stock exchange that would be considered to be an investment under ATG, but the budget was totally silent on it. On one hand, you are promoting a social stock exchange and on the other hand, there is no clarification in the tax laws. Right. Similarly, as I mentioned that a cross-border transaction, it has been approved for some number of years now, but there has right. been no clarification on outbound cross-border mergers. Similarly, if you see 4713B, which talks about conversion of a partnership into a company, even at a partner level, there is an exchange because the partner gives up his partnership interest in the partnership firm and gets the shares of the company. But the law is silent on it. So there are still a long way to go. There's still a long way to go. Absolutely. So while we were discussing a few points, we do have some queries coming in. Sure. Oh, uh, will I don't know if uh, this suits your uh, segment here. Will the new angel tax applicability for non resident investors affect the startup sector negatively? Yes, it does. That's the precise point which I was making. Like, suppose if the DCF value of some company is, say, 1000 rupees per share. Now, what 5627B is saying that the moment you raise above 1000 rupees, mm. you become taxable under the Indian law. That means even under FEMA, though FEMA allows you to raise beyond 1000, under FEMA, 1000 is the lower benchmark. Right. Right. So it becomes a discouraging factor for the startups that they will they will think twice before raising above 1000 rupees, which is their DCF value, because they will know there will be an immediate tax outflow from them. So the negotiations will change now. When a fundraise is being done from overseas and which is going to be above DCF, the tax factor will have to be taken into consideration that what would be the net proceeds in the hands of the uh, uh, the fundraiser. Absolutely right. Right. Uh, then, will this 10 crore limit, which we were discussing, will apply on sale of depreciable assets? I don't think so. I don't think so. It talks about... Uh, I, uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. Next is, if I transferred under construct property, under which section I would get exemption? Section 54 or 54F? It's residential property they're talking about, so then 54, I think so. The under construction one. Okay. Again, I'll have to check this. Yeah, because I think there's a controversy going on whether it's a proper residential property because since the possession certificate yes. is not good. So, there. I mean, we could go because 54F covers all kinds of assets. So, probably 54F could be a safer bet than the 54. safest one would be that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And if you have to take a liberal approach, you will go to section 54. Yes. Correct. Next, we have your will the restriction of double deduction of interest and taking as a part of cost of acquisition applied to builders as well. It should be. It should be at par. But it, you know, it talks about income from house property. A builder would not be uh, uh, submitting his income under house property. For him, it will be PGBP. So right. uh, strictly speaking, this amendment is not becoming applicable to them. So Correct. I mean, and in case of builders. I mean, yes, I mean, there could be a situation similar in that, that uh, dynamics as well. Absolutely. So coming up, next question is, let's see. So if I sell, say, five residential units and invest in one property of more than 10 crore, am I not eligible to a portion and claim from all sales? I'll have to check whether 54 says one residential property sold or is it reading uh, for multiple residential properties? Because, you know, 54, they have just put a limit on 10 crores. So I, I mean, seems logical that I may have sold two properties and the proceeds I'm investing in one. Uh, but we'll have to check whether it talks about sale of one property and reinvestment or it allows you multiple. Right. Next is, if the new property bought under Section 54 
of 54F is more than 10 crore by more owners, the cost per head has to be considered? Yes. It is uh, per, uh, per joint owner, basically, it has to be considered. Per joint owner? Yes. So I think people can have a good time planning it on this perspective then. Yeah, I mean, uh, we had uh, we had kind of uh, opined it on this also in the past. Achha, uh, okay. Where wife, husband are owners, do I get the benefit on a per owner basis? So hmm. yes, it, it, you get the benefit on a per owner basis. Oh, this is, I think, uh, for every listener, it's a route for a safe tax planning here. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, then one more please uh, disallowance of interest as a cost of property is prospective in nature prospective in nature I think so again this is applicable from 1st April 23 only financial year so again I'll, I'll have to check this I think this is actually a very uh, relevant topic. We do have more queries coming in. So Harish asked, Madam, full amount invested in property after sale, but construction not completed before three years. What is the position? <laughs> <laughs> I think there's not only the budget queries are coming in, I think general queries are too coming in. <laughs> this, is, this is like taking a position. <laughs> Because it says three years, or you are extending three years beyond three years. <laughs> Not the right platform to advise, I think. <laughs> um, then next is uh, capital gain has to be computed for each sale, and hence the exemption is also to be claimed for each sale, correct? Yeah. So, what's the question here? One second. <laughs> I think, meanwhile, I get the full question. There's another one coming. So you have your views on claim with respect to cost of acquisition with a with interest on self-occupied house property, which has not been allowed under the income from house property. That's nice. That's fine. That that should be fine. If you have not claimed it under income from house property, then you can claim it as part of cost of acquisition or cost of improvement. Okay. And I think we do have some time. Let's wait uh, for one more query to come in. Meanwhile, I had a personal uh, question. What is that one amendment brought in this budget, which is actually a very welcome change, which you thought is very was very much needed? So the what was very much needed has not come in the budget. <laughs> <laughs> what has come? But what is the? Yeah, but if you see, you know, general trend in the budget, Slowly and slowly, one, they are fading off all the exemptions. Okay. Right. Secondly, if you see the changes which come are more uh, draconian for the HNIs. So somewhat like a Robin Hood scenario is kind of prevailing. And like if you see this MLD change or the 54F change, these are all, you know, these kind of cut down the tax planning avenues for the HNIs. We have been, you know, over the years, at least now seven, eight years, we've been hearing the hearing a buzz in the news saying a state duty will come back, inheritance tax will come back. That is not coming back. Okay. Yeah. Right. But through this means they are trying to bring around parity that as far as any specific benefits available to the HNIs that are slowly and slowly getting cut off. That is that is one thing. The welcome changes, you know, in India, if you see that this EGR change, if I if I talk about the capital gain regime only, in India, people from ages, you know, we we traditionally have that mindset of holding gold, and you know, gold kept in lockers or at house, it's it's useless in a way. Right. It is not contributing to the progress of the country. So this change or this concept of EGR, and particularly amongst the young generations now i think so they would see it as a welcome change and you know they have they have provided it both ways you you mm. have the option of converting egr back to gold also it's not you are stuck with egrs only so the exemption has been provided both ways so that way that way i think so it's a good change uh, coming out in the budget but it's a slow understanding process i think for the taxpayer it Different. is very slow understanding, even, you know, traditionally accepting it is also going to be not so easy. Uh, right. This yeah. is what I was thinking, because we, we uh, the goal thing is not only an investment, but a status symbol also. Yes, yes. 
Ha, but so, that's why I'm saying, Didima, if they have allowed the change both ways, from gold to EGR, EGR to gold. So if there is ever a need, so that is also, there is also a probability of converting it back to gold also. Right. Okay. Perfectly right. So uh, I think uh, one question here. Any other questions while uh, we move on to the next session? I request everyone, if there's any other question, please. So I think, uh, as you said, for the exemption part that uh, the finance minister is actually moving away or uh, giving away with the all the exemption, I think the idea is clear. They have said it again and again that we need to simplify the tax. We need to simplify the tax. Yes. It any head, there are enormous exemption. And as we, I see, we uh, are so moving towards a digitalization era. Okay. So there will be a scenario where the tax filings become so simple that everybody just logs on to the income tax site, fills his income, and he's done with it. Right. So then we as a chartered accountant should <laughs> worry about it. No worries. Our need will not finish. <laughs> that, is, that is true. Because the in the path of simplifying it, complexities are still coming. That is also there, you know, and then rather than just, uh, you know, doing the uh, uh, focusing on this kind of work where you're filing tax returns, there is a wider avenue to, right. contribute to the economy at large in various other ways. So, right. so I don't think so. Uh, I mean, if I see I have never in my life helped a client file his returns. I've always been an MA guy. So, I mean, advisory is something very crucial for any transaction. Right. Next, uh, one query has come in. Just one second. Yeah. How does India's capital gain tax regime compare with other developed economies of the world today? <laughs> this is very so, interesting. No, no. So it's an interesting question, and that is what we keep kind of happening. If I leave around US, US has a very complicated tax regime in total. Okay. If you leave that out. Overseas, generally, I have seen capital gain is considered part of your income, business income only. There is no okay. separate rate. Like if you see Singapore, there is a 7%, 17% rate on your business income. 17% rate will be applicable to capital gain also if capital gain becomes taxable out there. So there, there are various parameters which have to be tested to see whether capital gain is exempt from taxation in Singapore or whether it is taxable. So that's a different scenario. But worldwide, if you see in most of the countries, capital gain is generally considered a part of your overall income. And the same corporate income tax rate becomes applicable to it. Right. The scenario which we have in India, where there are multiple rates, multiple period of holding, <laughs> multiple classes of assets, this is this Sorry. is not there overseas. Um, I forward it to you now, just now the mail. Yes, once. Yeah. So sorry. Yeah, absolutely right. I think this is uh, pretty much correct. Before... In fact, in a number of countries, capital gain is an exempt uh, right. asset, basically. But I think with the people uh, going to more tax avenues like Dubai coming with taxation. Yes. So yeah, I mean, will change. Uh, the, the thought process is worldwide 15% would become the basic tax rate. Absolutely. So, so then when it becomes 50%, then it is like everybody is at par. Hmm. Uh, Dubai is already coming up. But again, you know, Dubai is coming up with a 9% tax from June or July in this year. Right. But uh, it's still not applicable on capital gain. Hmm. So do you think that India is still, uh, as we can say, a strong investment asking oh, yes. country? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Taxation is not so much of a determining factor for inbound investment. Yes, if they could have simplified, it would have been an additional bonus and encouragement for the investors. But uh, that is not, it's the economy in general, the progress in the economy, which is the attraction factor for uh, FDI flow into the country. Perfect. I think that is what uh, solidly stands now with yes. so many countries having, I'll not use the word recession, but an economic backdrop right now. India is an attractive marketplace still, even after with all the complexities, right? Yes, yes, definitely. Great, great. So one last question uh, we have. 
as you said about the conversion of gold can the scheme of conversion of gold bonds vice versa be equated to preference shares to equity vice versa preference shares to equity is like a conversion so that is not taxable at the time of conversion yeah it's the, it's the same thing but not really a comparable kind of thing so principle is the same basically so they can but understand you know, yeah but you know you can convert preference into equity but not equity into preference hmm but that I, is not there yes that is there hmm. in the egr scenario it is both ways right exactly yeah but the basic principle is the same hmm on the state out the control part or on the value part yeah the conversion is tax exempt the cost of acquisition period of holding gets grandfathered so that principle is is the same the same absolutely so that was i think very engaging and it was very nice to have an interactive session with you uh, thanks a lot i was not expecting so many questions coming in it was very <laughs> no no there's there's not much uh, changes in the capital gain chapter so i couldn't have extended it for 45 minutes but uh, it was really great participating in uh, in this webinar thanks a lot for inviting me thank, thank you, you so much it was thank it was a pleasure having you thanks a lot again thank you bye thank you